So, son, you finally settled in as a Santa Cruzin' now? The Rancho Esteban grinned as he leaned forward to pour more melon brandy to Merritt Snifter. They sat on the wide brand of Esteban's Hacienda, gazing out at the weather screen over endless fields of wine melons and tarran wheat, rye, and corn under two of Santa Cruz's three small moons. The light glow of Ciudad Boulevard was a distant flush on the western horizon. The running lights of farming mechs gleamed as they went about their automated tasks, and the weather screen was set low enough to let the breeze through. The occasional bright flash as the screen zapped what passed for moths here lit the porch with small, private flares of lightning, but the night was hushed and calm. The only real sounds were the soft, whirring songs of insects, the companionable clink of glass and gurgling, pouring brandy, and Merritt sighed and stretched his legs comfortably out before him. I guess I just about am, Lorenzo. Still wish it weren't so damned hot and humid. I guess at heart I'm still a mountain boy from Heliacon, but it does grow on you, doesn't it? Wouldn't rightly know, Esteban replied as he set the bottle on the floor beside his chair and settled back to nurse his own glass. Only place I'd ever been's right here. Can't really imagine being anywhere else, but I reckon I'd miss it if I left and pulled up stakes. Well, it's a good thing you never have to now, isn't it? Merritt sipped at his glass and savored the cool, liquid fire of the brandies that trickled down his throat. He'd made a point of spending at least one evening a week visiting with Esteban or his cronies since his arrival. Nike's presence was no longer a military secret after all, and he recognized the dangers of settling into a hermit-like isolation, even with Nike to keep him company. Besides, he liked the old man. He even liked the way Esteban kept referring to him as son and boy. There were times when he got tired of being Captain Paul Merritt, slightly tarnished warrior, and the farmer's old, casual, fatherly ways were a kind of soothing memory of his boyhood. I heard from Enrique the day before yesterday. Says he got top credit for them melon shipment to Central. Looks like he and Ludmilla will be bringing the kids home next week. Wonder how they like the bright lights. Well, the coming home? Good. Enrique was Esteban's youngest son, a sturdy, quiet, competent farmer, about Merritt's own age, and Merritt liked him. He could actually beat Enrique occasionally at chess, unlike Nike, or for that matter, Lorenco. More than that, Enrique and his wife lived with the old man, and Merritt knew how much Lorenzo missed them, especially his grandchildren. I'll bet you've missed Milla's cooking, he added and grinned at Esteban's snort of amusement. Lud Milla Esteban was Hysenda's cybernetics expert. Her formal training was limited, but Merritt had seen her work, and she could have made a top-notch bolo tech any day. She spent most of her time when she wasn't chasing down her lively brood keeping the farm mechs up and running, which suited Esteban just fine. He had done his share of equipment maintenance over the years, and Mila's expertise freed him up to pursue his true education in the kitchen. Son, there's only one thing Mila can do that I can't, besides having kids. That is, and she and Enrique are doing a right good job of that too now that I think about it. But the only other thing I can't do is keep that dang cultivator in the river section up and running. Hanged if I know how she does it either. Less at pure ordinary stubbornness, that thing should have been scrapped by the time she stopped wetting her own diaper. Yeah, she's got the touch all right, that Merritt agreed. She sure does, better than I ever was. I was a pretty fair electronicist myself, you know. Speaking of electronicists, the field's been crawling with them the last three days. Most just due for its regular training exercise the Wolverines this week. They've been overhauling and system checking them. Is that this week? Merritt quirked an eyebrow. The beginnings of a thought flickered lazily in the depths of his mind. Yep. Consuela moved it up 10 days on account mid-season harvest looks like it's coming in early this year. Hard to get them boys and girls of hers together when it's melon picking time for less than something downright dire. I imagine so. Merritt pressed his glass to his forehead. Even at this late at night, it was perspiration warm on Santa Cruz, and he closed his eyes. He had met most of Santa Cruz militia since his arrival. Like Esteban himself, they were a casual, slow-speaking lot, but they were also far more than professional and tougher bunch than he'd expected, which was his own fault, not theirs. He'd grown up on a frontier planet himself and seen enough of them in flames since joining the Dinochrome Brigade. Frontier people seldom forgot they were Concordiat Fringe, the first stop of any trouble that came calling on humanity, or for the human dregs who preyed upon their own kind. The SCM's personnel might be short on spit and polish and their wolverines might be ancient, but they knew their stuff and Merritt knew he wouldn't have cared to be the raiders who took them on. And now that he thought of it, tell me, Esteban, 
How do you think Colonel Gonzalez would like some help with her training exercises? Help? What kind of help you got in mind, son? Well... Merritt opened his eyes, sat up, and swung his chair to face the older man. You know I'm trying to compile a performance log on 0075, right? He was always very careful never to call Nike by name. No one on Santa Cruz was likely to know how Bolo commanders normally refer to their commands by name, not number, and he worked very hard to avoid such sloppy speech habits that might suggest Nike's true capabilities to anyone. You've mentioned it a time or two. Esteban allowed himself a slow smile. Well, it's a fairly important consideration given 7-5's age. Central's not exactly current on the Mark 23's operational parameters after all. Given the lack of ops data on file, I need to generate as much experience on my own as I can. Besides, you kind of like playing with it, don't you? Esteban said so slightly that Merritt blushed. The old man laughed. Shoo, son. You think I wouldn't get a kick out of driving around the jungle and something like that? Been looking over the weather side imagery. It looks like you've been leaving great big footprints over them poor trees around your depot. All right, all right, you got me, Merritt conceded with a laugh of his own. I do get a kick out of it, but I've been careful to stay on the naval reserve. Last thing I want to do is chew up one of the nature preserves or someone's private property. Planet's a big place. Reckon you can drive around the sticks all you want without hurting anything. Yeah, you're probably right. But the things I had in mind that Colonel Gonzalez is planning an exercise with the Wolverines, maybe 7-5 and I could give her an independent aggressor force to exercise against. Go up against a bolo and wolverines. That'd be a real quick form of suicide if you tried it for real, son. Sure it would, but the experience would do her cruise good. And it'd give me a lot more data for my performance log. I've been running 7-5 through sims, but I can't just set up a proper field exercise of my own because I don't have another bolo to match it against. Maybe. Of course, turning 14 wolverines against a bolo is really going to mess up a lot of jungle. Well... Everything for about 200 clicks south of the field belongs to the Navy, and I guess that means it belongs to me at the moment, since, with all due respect to the fleet-based CO, I am the senior and only Concordiate officer on the planet. If the colonel's interested, we could set up an exercise between the field and the depot. In fact, we might set up a couple of them, one with the militias and aggressor force attacking the depot, and one with them defending the field. They'd probably get more good from the second one, too, now that I think about it. Why? Because, Merrick grinned smugly as he offered the bait he knew Colonel Gonzalez would leap for. I'll bet the SCM doesn't know the depot has a complete planetary reconnaissance system. Are you kidding me, son? Well, I know you well enough to know, but you're not one for tall tales, boy. But I've been running the field navigating the commsats and the weather going on 30 years now. I ain't never near seen no sign of recon satellites. They're up there, Lorenzo, I promise. And I'd be real surprised if you had seen them, given their stealth features. But the point is, if the colonel's interested, I could set up a direct downlink into her wolverines for the second exercise. And I could reconfigure the depot's comm systems to set a permanent link to the SCM for future use. You know as well as I do how useful that could be if push ever did come to shove out here. You got that right, Paul. Well, Consuela was always a bloodthirsty wench. Reckon she'd just be tickled pink to get her hands on a planetary recon that sounds to me like you got yourself a date, Captain. Got everything left, Barry will need to find her way to your absence, Cliff. Colonel Clifton Sanders, Dinochrome Brigade Support Command, set the fat folio of data chips on a superior desk and nodded with a smile. Right here, sir. I had a talk with Shigematsu before I left, too. He's up to speed on all my current projects. I don't think Major Luffberry will hit any problems he and she can't handle between them. Good. Brigadier Winzicki cocked his chair back to smile up at a senior maintenance officer. It's about time you took a vacation, Cliff. Do you realize how much leave time you've accrued since you've been out here? What can I say? I like my work and I don't have any family. Might as well put the time into doing something worthwhile. I can't say I'm sorry you feel that way. But I do feel a little guilty about it sometimes, Winzicki said. If anyone needs a break from time to time, it's only to keep his brain from going stale. I don't want another four years passing without you using up some of your leave time, Cliff. I can imagine I can live with that order, sir, Sanders grinned. On the other hand, I've got this funny feeling you may change your tune if I ask for some of that leave in, say, the middle of our next cost efficiency survey. You probably would, too, Winziski agreed with a chuckle. Well, go on. Get out of here. We'll see you back in a couple of months. Yes, sir. Sanders came to attention, saluted, and then walked out of the office. He nodded the brigadier's uniform reception as secretary in passing, but deep inside, he hardly even noticed the young man's presence. 
her hidden worry pulsed behind his smile. Why now? Damn it. Ten years. Ten years he'd put into preparation for his retirement. Another two years. Three at the outside. And everything would have been all ready. Now all he'd worked for was in jeopardy. And now he had no choice but to run even still greater risks. He fought an urge to wipe his forehead as he rode the exterior elevator down the gleaming flank of the arrogant tower, which toused Ursula's sector general command. But he couldn't stop the churning of his brain. It had all seemed so simple when he first began. He wasn't the first officer who worried about what he'd do when his active duty days were done, nor was he the first to do anything about it. The big corporations, especially like those like Galcorp, who did big ticket business with the military, were always on the lookout for retired senior officers to service consultants and lobbyists. ex dinochrome brigade officers were an especially sought after commodity, given the centrality of the bolos to the Concordia's strategic posture, but it was the men and women with field experience whom those corporate recruiters usually considered the true plums. They were the ones with all the glitz and glitter, the sort of people the Concordiat senators listened to. Unfortunately for Clifton Sanders, he wasn't a field officer. Despite his position as Ursula Sector's senior maintenance officer, he wasn't even really a technician. He was an administrator, one of those absolutely indispensable people who managed the flow of money, materials, information, and personnel so that everyone else, including those glittering field officers, could do their jobs. Without men and women like Sanders, the entire Dinochrome Brigade would come to a screeching halt, yet they were the non-entities. The invisible people no one noticed, and who seldom drew the attention that won high-level and high-paying civilian jobs after retirement. Sanders had known that. It was a reason he had been willing to make himself attractive some before retirement, and for ten years, he had been one of Galcorp's eyes and ears within the brigade. It had even helped his military career, for the information he could pass on had grown in value as he rose in seniority, and Galcorp had discreetly shepherded his career from behind the scenes, maneuvering him into positions from which both they and he could profit. Four years ago, they had helped slip him into his present post as the officer in charge of all of Ursula Sector's maintenance activities. He had been in two minds about taking the assignment. Ursula wasn't exactly the center of creation, but the data access of a sector maintenance chief was enormous. In many ways, he suspected he was actually a better choice than someone in a similar position in one of the core sectors. He had the same access, but the less formal pace of a frontier sector gave him more freedom to maneuver and made it less likely that an unexpected security suite might stumble across his extracurricular activities. He had paid his dues. He told himself resentfully as the elevator reached the ground level and stopped. He stepped out, hailed an air taxi, punched his trip coordinates into the computer and sat back with a grimace. The data he provided Galcor had more than millions at the very least. No one could reach the level he'd reached within maintenance, logistics, and procurement without being able to put a price tag on the insights he'd help provide his unknown employers. He'd earned the corporate position they'd promised him, and now they had to spring this crap on him? He frowned out the window as the taxi rose and swept off towards Hillman Field. He should have refused, he thought anxiously. Indeed, he would have refused, except that he was in far too deep for that. He'd already broken enough security regulations to guarantee that his retirement would never be a problem for him if the brigade ever found out. The Concordia would provide him with a lifetime accommodation. A bit cramped, perhaps, with a door that he couldn't unlock if it ever discovered how much classified information he'd ever divulged. And that was the hook he couldn't wiggle off however hard he tried, because he couldn't prove he'd handed it to Galcourt. He knew who his employer was, but he didn't have a single shred of corroborating evidence, which meant he couldn't even try to cut a deal with the prosecutors in return for some kind of immunity. Galcourt could drop him right in the toilet without splashing its own skirts whenever it chose to, and it would, he told himself. If he didn't do exactly what his masters told him to, they'd do exactly that. His gloomy thoughts enveloped him so completely he hardly noticed the trip to Hillman Field, and with some surprise that he realized the taxi was landing. It set him down beside the pedestrian belt, and he slipped a five-credit token into the meter instead of using his card. The taxi computer considered, and then burped out his change, and he climbed out and watched it speed away. He glanced around casually before he stepped onto the belt. It was stupid of him, and he already knew it, but he couldn't help it. Security didn't know what he was up to. If it had, he'd already be in custody yet he couldn't quite suppress the instinctive urge to look for anyone who might be following him. He grunted in a sour, bitter amusement at himself and let the belt carry him through the concourse. 
His reservation was pre-cleared, but he had to change belts twice before the last one deposited him at the boarding ramp of the Gal Coral Line's passenger shuttle. A human flight attendant checked his ticket, then ushered him into the first class section. Here's your seat, Colonel Sanders. Have a pleasant flight. Thank you. Sanders leaned back into his comfortable seat and closed his eyes with a sigh. He still didn't know everything he was going to have to do, and he wished with all his heart that he wasn't going to find out, but he was. He'd been informed there were three associates waiting to meet him aboard the passenger ship, who would have his complete instructions, but the data he'd already been ordered to extract told him where he was headed. Santa Cruz. That it would have something to do with the obsolete bolo on Santa Cruz. There was no other reason for him to pull the data they'd wanted, but what in God's name did they want with a maintenance officer on Santa Cruz?